morning, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Please say hello to one another. And if could we get the house lights up just a little bit, please? Um, can you please, uh, yeah, say hello, welcome. Welcome to um, this wonderful time when we come together and worship one another. Um, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. It's so good to be with people together. We wanna welcome um, everyone who's here today. Hands up if you're comfortable with it. If you are a visitor today or here with us for the first time, are you? do we have anyone here who's willing to put their hands up and say hello? Yep, thank you, welcome, welcome. It's so good to have you with us. Um, yeah, uh, it's great to have um, visitors with us. Please would you join us after the service for morning tea? Um, and uh, yeah, we'd love to, to meet with you, gather with you, find out a bit more about you. Also, church uh, upper room will be open this week again. So go and get your lunch, come back, let's sit together as family and have that bit of time of fellowship. A reminder that we are the Wesley International Congregation of Wesley Mission. And for our current members, what is our vision, WIC? I'm not hearing you, louder. For our visitors. Transform lives, transforming cities. We come here to be transformed by the living God so that He can transform, take us, and when He takes us out and we transform by His Spirit, that by His Spirit, that it transforms the lives of those around us. That is who we are as a mission. Um, that is what we stand for, uh, and that is what we walk into. And we, we do that in God's strength and His strength alone. Um, a few little announcements before we continue on with our service. Amazingly, this week, this week, um, I think it was Thursday, Lifeline, which started in our church and is now um, across the globe, started had its 60th anniversary. So Lifeline has been around for 60 years and we praise God for that, right? We praise God for what he's done, for the number of lives that have been, have been um, saved, for what he has done through this amazing, what I would actually call a ministry in amazing ways. So 60 years, next Sunday we're going to be celebrating Lifeline and those 60 years in this theater at 4 p.m. I would highly encourage you to come and celebrate this amazing, um, this amazing milestone that God has given us and to hear the inspiring and the encouraging stories of what is God is doing in and through his people in this place and beyond. Um, you know, my aunt, it's, it's quite interesting the connection with this place because my aunt is a director of Lifeline in South Africa. And when I came here, I was like, and I saw, oh my goodness, this is where it started. And I said to her, would you believe it? I'm ministering in the same place where Lifeline started. So you know, we see God just moving and weaving and linking. So yeah, definitely wanna be here next week for that celebration. Easter is fast and furiously approaching. Just wanna let you know that there is an amazing drama that's being, that God is inspiring um, because I've been watching it as I've, I've been in the sessions and he's inspiring this amazing drama. I wanna encourage you to put it in your diaries and bring others. This is gonna be amazing. Martin Place, Good Friday, 1 p.m. Come, come to this place where there will be um, yeah, drama, just a place of worship, a place of reflecting on what Jesus did for us on the cross. And then we will be having our usual uh, Sunday services on Easter Sunday, but in the morning, get up to watch Channel 9 at 6 a.m. where uh, we will be um, having a program that focuses on worshiping the Lord on Easter Sunday on 6, 6 a.m. Channel 9. Get up, get your hot cross bun, get your cuppa, and come and worship with us online. Um, and then, then what you can do is come in, and we're very excited to say that we will be baptizing people on Sunday, on Easter Sunday, the 9th of April, always a really exciting time. If you're wanting to get baptized, please come and have a chat to myself, Pastor Andy, uh, and just to let you know that there are online Zoom baptism um, classes this uh, Wednesday, the 22nd, 
And then on the 29th of March, 7 p.m. on Zoom, please let us know. Um, yeah, I want to encourage you. If you've not been water baptised yet, please. It's, it's just a wonderful thing to, to do and, and help you to grow in your faith and, and um, encourage everyone. Um, just a quick reminder, Shalom is on this week, both in person and online, ladies, um, from 10 a.m., 10, 15 a.m. Please come and join us. We've been having some amazing conversations about freedom in Christ. And the Freedom uh, Exodus Bible Studies are online for your life groups and even for individual study. Pastor Andy uh, wrote those, and they are pretty amazing. So I want to encourage you to really, um, yeah, go online and, and get those. Thanks so much, Johnny. Um, we now come to um, a time in our service, um, which is really part of our worship. Um, it, you know, worship is, is about bringing our whole selves to God. It's about saying, you are God and I am not. And part of that worship is to bring some, an, an offering. God is part of worshiping God through the Bible. It's Bringing, bringing your first fruits, bringing your best to God, to say, Lord, I thank you for what you've given me, but I also honor you as Lord, and I trust in you to provide. I trust in you with everything that I am. And so we're going to be taking up um, that offering, that act of worship to our God, to give back to him some of what he's given us. So that, so that and here's what God does. You know, we give and he pours out. And he pours out into more of the community to grow his kingdom. And so that is what it is. And as we pour out, he pours in. Um, and so we, we're going to be taking up this offering for the work of mission and ministry in this city, in this place. Now, um, you might give online. And if you want to give online, there's a code that you can just scan and it It'll take you to the page for doing that. You might want to give um, physically right now. Um, and so we'll, we just want to take this time just to offer this to the Lord. Let, it, let us pray. Our great God, we thank you that the very breath in our lungs comes from you. Every experience that we've had the work that you've given us, everything that we have comes from you. As Paul says, what, did you, what do you have that you did not receive? And so, Lord, we acknowledge you as the source of life, the source of all our power, the one who provides. And we come and we bring our offering to you, Lord, and we say, Lord, we, we give it to you, we praise you, we worship you. We know that they're meager and we know that you do not need them but you use them for your glory and that more might come to know you. And so we pray, Lord, that you would take these offerings now and that you would be using them for your glory. May they be put to good use. And Lord, we give them with surrendered hearts. May our hearts be surrendered, not to give for what we can get, not to give out of compulsion or guilt, but to give joyfully in honour and worship of our great God who will never leave us or never forsake us. So Lord, we give this offering in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thanks. All right, we're now going to have our Bible reading. Can I get our Bible reader to come up? Thanks, Eng. Morning, church. Today's uh, scriptures reading is uh, Exodus uh, chapter 3, verses 4 to 11. Exodus uh, chapter 3, verses 4 to 11. I'm reading from the NIV. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face, 
because she was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them out, up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites have reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now, go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring, them, bring the Israelites out of Egypt? This is the word of the Lord. Work, I might just use the handheld. Okay, great. Thanks, Jackie. All right. Well, church, um, it's wonderful to be here together to worship Jesus. Anyone love Jesus in the house today? He's so beautiful, isn't he? Such a glorious, wonderful saviour. Uh, there are some things that are happening across the church that would be good for us to continue to be um, mindful of and prayerful of. And one of those things is, um, yeah, our beloved uh, sister Irene Yo, her mum passed away um, recently. And so we haven't had a chance to um, be able to pray together as a church for her uh, together on Sunday. So would you please be thinking of her? And if you know her, send her a message. Uh, and let's keep the family in prayer at this time. Um, even though she was elderly, it's always a shock to the system when you lose someone whom you love. Uh, so we want to keep Irene in prayer. Uh, also, some other things that are happening too is uh, this past week we had the Propel Network Conference. Uh, Propel is a network of uh, ministers, leaders, churches across the Uniting Church um, in Australia uh, who have a passion for coming together, generally an evangelical heart, a desire to see the kingdom of God expand, the gospel proclaimed, discipleship and evangelism and church planting. Uh, Stu and a few others came together and set that up a few years back. And uh, we were blessed to be able to host that this past week. I want to mention that just to, to say thank you again to people who volunteered for that. Can we just take a moment and just thank them? Really appreciate it. Some of our crew came in, they took time off work to be able to lead in worship and serve in different ways, and it was beautiful to see God moving. Um, and to share, to say, you know, it's not just about what happens in our space here in WIC. God is doing something greater, and the more we have our eyes attentive to what God is doing beyond just what's happening in our little space, the more we can engage with the way that his kingdom is expanding. We've all got a part to play in that. Um, and please keep praying as well for the beautiful uh, movement that's happening with gambling reform uh, across New South Wales. Um, and we've been seeing some amazing fruit in that. Uh, Stu's been providing some excellent leadership in that space. But without prayer, right? So let's pray. Let's commit this to the Lord. He sees the chains. He hears the groans. He wants to do something about that. And together, we want to pray uh, for that too. Let's pray. Jesus, as we come to your word right now, firstly, we do lift up Irene to you and pray that you administer to her and her family as they grieve the loss of her mum. Comfort her in the way that only your Holy Spirit can. Oh Lord, to all those that engage with Propel, bless them as they return to their ministries. May they go back with an extra skip in their step because of the breath of your Holy Spirit upon them and the encouragement from others, other sisters and brothers as well. Lord, we continue to pray. Uh, that as we continue to listen to your voice, that you would weave us into your beautiful plan and purpose, give us eyes to see beyond just what's happening in our individual lives and in our small groups. Lift up our eyes to see what you are doing all around us, Lord God, and show us that together with you and one another, the cities that we live in can be transformed. And the world in which we live in can be transformed. So, Lord, as we come to your word, open wide our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Well, we are continuing our journey on the theme of freedom in 2023. And as we said uh, a little while back when we started this, God's desire for every single believer in Jesus is that we would be set free and that we would also uh, be part of what God is doing to set other people free, to set free, to be set free and to set free. That is the purpose of God for our lives. And so what God does is, oh, that's meant to be Moses, by the way, in case you're wondering. So who's that, who's that guy with a perm? All right. So what God does as he works out his freedom plan in our lives and around us is he plans, he strategizes. He works out, what am I going to do? Who am I going to get? How are we going to weave this together? What will, what will happen at which point in order that freedom might come into people's lives and that whole, whole peoples can be set free? And then he gets to a certain point in his planning where it's a crucial point when he starts to invite people into that plan of his freedom that he has. When he calls people, he taps people on the shoulder and says, okay, you, come. I want to show you what I'm doing. And I want to show you what I am uh, about to do through your life. And he gives us that choice. So... Um, I love this quote. Your career is what you are paid for. Your calling is what you're made for. Uh, Steve Harvey, he's an American TV show host. Uh, Hey, look, I think the quote's good. (laughs) All right, so anyway. um, What you do in your life, your primary context, you know, whether you're stay at home, whether you're retired, whether you're a student, uh, whether you're working, or whether you're looking for work, whatever it is that your context is, That's not what you were necessarily made for, right? And sometimes what we can do is we confuse our career with our purpose, with which God has made us. The beautiful reality is that God has made every single one of us with a purpose in his heart and mind with which we are in this generation for a reason. You were not born in insert birth year insert birth date, where you lived, where you grew up, and where you're living now, by accident. There's a purpose in the heart of God. And it's a little bit like this funnel. There's a general call of God. Oh, I should have reformatted. There's a general calling of God, right, which we could point to as the top of that funnel. And that general calling is what we see in the Word of God. We are called to holy living. We are called to follow Christ Uh, We are called as citizens of heaven. There's many things that God calls us to, right? Um, Oh, thank you. Thanks, Johnny. Now, the joy of life, where we start to feel um, that that we get traction, uh, it's like what uh, the the chariots of fire, um, uh, uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but when he's he's running, oh, you remember, Stu, what's his name? Eric Eric Little, that's his name. And he said, when I run, I feel the joy of God. And it's like that, that sense of, you you get a sense of what you were there for, you live into it, and you feel that sense of, ah, yes, this is what I was made for. And so we believe in WIC that there is a unique calling of God on every believer's life. And even if you're here today, you're not a believer in Jesus, he invites you into that, he wants to reveal that, because he has a purpose for everyone, should they yield to that. And there is joy in discovering our unique calling and purpose and living into that. And the beauty of this is, you know, you were not made for your career or your studies or your context. God made you for a purpose, and when you and I get clarity on that purpose, we can live that out. Whatever uh, context we're in, whatever age we are, whatever gender, whatever socioeconomic situation, doesn't matter how rich or poor you are, doesn't matter whether you feel your energy or not, you and I can live into that calling and purpose by the grace of God. <clears throat> so my question is, well, God is calling you. God is calling you, every single one of you. God is calling me. Do you know what that calling is? Do you know what that purpose is? It's a unique plan for you to live out your purpose in the way that he has made you, in the way that he's gifted you, the way that he's shaped you, and the way that he is shaping you 
for the people of, of people that he's leading you to, do you know what that sense of calling is? Who would say, oh, no, I'm not really sure. New wave. Yep. Okay, who would say, yeah, I think I've got a rough idea, but maybe I need more clarity on that. Yeah, okay. Who was like, yeah, no, I'm pretty sure I know what my sense of calling is. Paul Tramp puts his hand straight away. Yep. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, whatever stage of the journey of understanding and discerning our sense of call is, we're going to be encouraged today by the passage that we see in Exodus because to grow confident about our sense of calling and purpose, when we look at the, 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 the experience that Moses had, I think it applies to all of us. What God does is he prepares, he proposes, and then he pledges. He prepares, he proposes, and then he pledges. And I hope by, by the end of this time, there will be something stirring within our spirit to take a hold of the call of God that he has for our life and to stir each other up, to, to, to kind of spur one another on to discover and live into that purpose. But as he prepares, proposes, and pledges, the ball's in our court. We need to decide how we're going to respond to the voice of the Spirit calling out to us from the fire. Now, firstly, God prepares. So what happens, uh, building on from last week, you would have heard uh, Corey's message uh, if you were here. He talked about how Moses tried to take justice in his own hands and um, the trouble that he gets into uh, in that process. But Moses flees to Midian to escape from Egypt. He becomes a fugitive. And in the process, the suffering and the oppression of the Israelites gets worse and worse and worse. And so they cry out for help. Help, help, they're desperate. And that cry reaches God. And it moves the heart of God. It says he hears their groaning. He sees their pain. He knows their struggle. He remembers his covenant and He's moved in all these ways and he makes a decision to come into their situation and personally deliver them from their plight into his beautiful promises. God is moved and he moves. And the next part of his plan, the next step of this is to invite Moses to be his mouthpiece, to be the instrument through which he del delivers his people. And so as I mentioned before, here's Moses. He'd been living in Midian for 40 years after he'd been running away from Egypt as a fugitive. Uh, for those of you who weren't here last week, he killed an Egyptian man that was mistreating a Hebrew slave. And uh, because of that, uh, he knew that he was busted, that people knew about it, so he ran away to Midian. And so for 40 years in Midian, on the backside of the desert, he gets married to a Midian, Midianite woman. Um, and whose, whose dad is, uh, is a priest in Midian. He becomes a shepherd, you know, so he's got all these sheep that he has to take care of. And at this stage, he's 80 years old. He's a shepherd. He's a fugitive. And he's got a family. So in the middle of a shepherding day, God creates a bush, sets it on, uh, makes it look like it's on fire to be able to get Moses' attention and Moses comes closer. And God calls out to Moses, Moses, don't come any closer. Right? Take off your sandals. This is holy ground. God's holy. And we see in the whole of the scriptures, if we are not careful in the way that we approach God or before Christ particularly, we're not careful in the way that we approach God, we could die in a moment. And God does not want that to happen to Moses because who's going to lead his people out of, you know, anyway. So, no, this is holy ground. Take your sandals off. And then Moses obeys and God starts to reveal himself. He says, I am the God of your fathers. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I love this. 
God's not random in what he's, he's, he's not like, you know, I'm not someone who's just kind of popping up here. I'm not a random being that's approaching you. I am the God who has made promises to your ancestors. That's who I am. Moses, you need to know that. I am the God of covenant. I've already got a plan here. I've already made promises. I've come to fulfill them. God is not cold, but he's a God of compassion. His whole being is moved. He's, he hears, he sees, you know, he feels, he remembers. He's moved by the pain of his people. That's why he acts. That's why he speaks. That's why he's moving. He wants to liberate them. God is not a lone ranger. He's a collaborator. He's the God of calling. And to, so to fulfill his covenant and to express his compassion, he calls Moses to join him to set them free. I love the beautiful reality that God is a covenant God and that is what moves him. That God is a God of compassion and that is what moves him. I love the fact that cries lead to callings. And so he calls us. He sees the tears and the pain and the brokenness of the people all around us. He knows the weeping of our neighbors. He understands the restless nights of the people in our city, the people that we know at work and at school and in our, in our families, in our friends. He knows that. He sees that. He is moved by that because he is a God of compassion. He wants to bless them because he is a God of covenant. He wants to bless them through Christ. And he wants to bless them through Christ, through you. And so he calls you. He calls me. I don't know if anyone remembers Mission Impossible. The old school one. The old school. Anyone know the old school Mission Impossible? Okay. Okay. There's just a couple of people here. Or maybe you're watching something else, you know, like some, some other K-dramas or something like that. I don't know. All right. So <clears throat> with Mission Impossible, it was fascinating, right? Because there was this team of people where uh, every week or every episode, they would get some sort of a, a special mission. Uh, and they would receive it either in the car or, you know, they'd go to a vending machine and it would just come up. You know, it'd be some random kind of ordinary place, which I think is cool because that's what happens to Moses. He gets his call in an ordinary place. So it'd be just random ordinary places. They would get this mission and, you know, uh, it would have a warning in it. It would say this. It would say, your mission, should you choose to accept it, dot, dot, dot. And then a warning that the message itself is going to self-destruct in 10 seconds. And, uh, and then so they've got to quickly, you know, like do something with it and get away, right? And, you know, of course, I only know the Tom Cruise version because I'm, I'm a little bit younger. Not much, you can tell, right? But, you know, the Tom Cruise version, he gets the message and he just walks away. And, you know, the thing explodes with a slow motion with him, you know, at the front, right? So the cool thing is that it seems like an impossible task, every time they get this mission. How are they going to do it? How are they going to pull it off? There's so much risk. You know, they, they probably don't even have the resources to be able to do it. How are they going to fulfill this impossible mission? But every episode, the team steps up, they risk their lives, and against the odds, they save the world. So, God is calling you and me. God is calling us into what might seem like an impossible mission. Five missional communities, five church plants, 500 missional leaders. That might seem like an impossible mission, but God is calling us. My encouragement for us is, hey, look, let's lean in. God is calling you, Steph. God is calling you, Robin. God is calling you, Stephen. God is calling you and he's calling me. God is calling you, Tommy. Will we lean in? God is calling you, Melva. Will we lean in and say, here I am, Lord. I don't know what it is. I'm not sure what's going to happen, but here I am, Lord. I want to lean in. So let's seek to understand how he wants to weave us into his plan and his purpose. 
God proposes. That's the next thing we see here. So after all the formalities are out of the way in his conversation with Moses, oh, Moses, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, oh, okay, wonderful, I'm going to send you. I'm going to send you. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And so Moses replies, no worries, Yahweh. I'm ready to go. Is that what he says? <laughs> Moses resists God's plan. He's not sure that he's convinced. He's got two main doubts. Doubt number one, who am I? You want me to go? I'm not the right person. Maybe he thought, I'm a fugitive. I don't have authority. I'm 80 years old. I'm a shepherd. I've got too many sheep to manage now. I've got a family. You know, like, who am I? I I've got all these things. I've, you know, no, I'm not the right person. And then he starts talking about his lack of skill. Annalise was telling me that everyone in her class at the moment, uh, if, something, if someone can't do something, then they'll just go, oh, skill issue. You know, oh, skill issue, you know. Uh, the teacher's presentation does, doesn't work. Oh, skill issue. Yeah, skill issue. <laughs> right. And I think it's hilarious, you know, that kids in year seven are going, oh, yep, skill issue. <laughs> Moses felt like he had a skill issue, Right? He says, I've never been eloquent. I'm slow of speech, you know, and tongue. In other words, God, let me explain something here. For this project to be successful, you need someone good at comms. You need someone who's able to get up and, and facilitate this meeting with the Israelite elders here. I'm not that person. I don't have the skills. The second doubt is, what if they? First one is, who am I? Second one is, what if they? Uh, what if they ask me who you are? What do I say? He is the God of the bush that does not burn. What do I say? And what if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? You know, uh, these questions about our sense of identity or worth or uncertainty about whether we have skills or ability to do the things that we believe that we are to do, these things happen in everyday life, don't they, right? They happen with work. They happen, you know, with our studies. They happen in our relationships. Do I really have what it takes to pull this off? You know, sometimes we have imposter syndrome. Anyone experienced that before? I know I have. Okay, I'm in this position, but man, if people knew how scared I was, you know, or people knew that, that I don't know what to do right now, right? These are things that we struggle with with everyday life, let alone a calling of God which might seem impossible. And if God called us today to, hey, Jacob, I'm gonna send you to Kiev, you're gonna set Ukraine free. Like what? During Nazi... Uh, Germany in World War II, imagine that. Yeah, Andy, I'm going to set you into Nazi Germany to set the Jewish people free. What? You'd probably have the same two questions, right? Who am I? What if they? A lot of what if they in that situation, right? You know, I've had countless, countless doubts about my sense of call over the years. Just being real with you, when they first, even when I was interviewing to be the youth pastor, I thought, I've never been a youth anything before. I've, I've just been a life group leader. I'm inexperienced. They probably won't want me, you know? I, I lacked confidence. Back then, I was so much more insecure I'd look at other leaders. So, oh man, I can't do what they do. Sam Donnelly was so intimidating. He's such a confident dude, you know, preaching the, the messages in the young adults. I can't do, I can't preach like that. John Fung, 
I don't know how many instruments he could play and, you know, like the kind of leadership gift, you know, he just had that charisma about him. I looked at him, I thought, I can't do that. I'm, I'm young, I don't speak well, others are better, they won't like me. They'll say that I'm young and inexperienced, you name it. And I wish I could say that all of that goes away once you hit a certain point, it doesn't. But what I'm here to say is, don't let the doubts stop you. Don't let them stop you. Don't let the who am I and what if they stop you from leaning in to the voice of the call of God and stepping into that purpose and plan. I know often it is said, God does not call the qualified, but he qualifies the called. If he calls you, you can do it. Not self-help, you know, Tony Robbins kind of stuff. If God calls you, you can do it because of him. And so God gives six powerful pledges to Moses to affirm him. And I pray that these six would encourage you. They would make, I pray that they would make the hair on the back of your head stand with the sense of, oh God, yes, I want to live into my calling. And the first one is this. He pledges his presence. Verse 12 of Exodus 3, God said, I will be with you. The first pledge that God gives to Moses when he resists, he says, he says, Moses, you're not going to be on your own. I am with you all the way through this. I'm not sending you out from here. I'm going to wait on this mountain. I'm going to be with you. My presence goes with you the whole way. The same promise was given to Joshua. And it's the same promise that Jesus gives to his disciples after he gives them the commission. He says, lo, I am with you to the very end of the age. When Jesus said that to his disciples, it wasn't a throwaway line. It was, oh, you know, um, after I commissioned them, I should add something just to kind of wind up that conversation. Oh, this sounds good. No. The presence of God is infinitely more powerful and significant than we realize. I am with you I will be with you are some of the most powerful promises. It's one of the most powerful promises that God has ever made to his people. And as a kid, I don't know what your upbringing was like, but for many of us, you know, if mom's there or if dad's there, oh, we will swing off those monkey bars. We will climb that ladder. You know, we'll jump into that sand pit, right? Because mom or dad's there. The presence gives us that confidence. You, you have the presence of God to fulfill your call. I have the presence of God to fulfill my call. Amen? So don't be afraid. Number two, prophecies. This shall be a sign. You shall worship me on this mountain. So God also pledges that he's going to give signs to Moses. And when you think about it this way, right, if you imagine that we are on Mount Sinai right now, God is essentially saying, right, about 315 kilometers away, there's about 3 million people, men, women, and children. They are in slavery under a dictator, and I'm going to send you, let's just say Wagga Wagga. That's about 315 kilometers away. They're all in Wagga Wagga. No offense to anyone from Wagga Wagga. And the sign's going to be that three million of those people are going to be right here worshiping. That's the sign.
You'll, you'll approach Pharaoh. God, God keeps giving glimpses of what's going to happen. You'll approach Pharaoh. He'll resist. I'll show my power. He'll let you go. So these prophecies, they're signs. They're signs that affirm that God is who he says he is and that he will do what he says he will do and that we are on the right track. That's what prophecies do. Before they happen, here's a sign that's going to come and the sign comes later, later down the track and we go, okay, God, you're in control. I am at peace. I'm on the right track. Helps us know that he's got us. The scripture and the spirit keep giving promises to remind us of who he is, that he's got us, and he has got the situation in hand. I don't know if you've ever been on a bushwalk before, and you've never been there. You're on the bushwalk, and you're not sure if you're on the right way, because all of a sudden, the track doesn't kind of look like a track anymore. Anyone experienced that before, right? And you're looking, you're looking around, you're hoping you could see something, you keep walking, and then... Oh, thank God there's a sign. 5.2 Ks to, you know, Terry's Creek. Oh, great, okay. I'm on the right way, right? And that's what it's like. You know, and the reason why those signs have been put there, sometimes very strategically, is because the path makers knew that you'd get to that point and you'd go, oh, hang on a second. Am I on the right path here? And that all of a sudden we would see that sign. And that we'd go, yep, okay, yep, I know where I'm going. Yep, I'm on the right way. And I have to say, though, that not all signs are really clear. Like, I went for a walk with my family, and I got to this intersection. I went, T Terry's Creek Walk. Uh, to, to a... And so I had to take a photo of it. Right? <laughs> Thank God that he is clearer than this. But I'm here to tell you, as God calls... He will give signs. He will give prophecies to fulfill his call in your life and my life. How do I know this? That's the way that God works. And that's the way I've seen him work in my life and in countless lives of the people around me. Little signs, little signs along the way that you are able to fulfill the call that he has for you. Number three, promises. Chapter 3, verse 17, I promise that I'll bring you up out of Egypt to the land flowing with milk and honey. God gives promises to assure Moses that he will come through. God is a promise-making God, and he's also a promise-keeping God, isn't he? We see that all throughout the Scriptures. And so if you're curious about the call that God has for your life, I'm so confident of this. He will make promises to you. Some of them he's already given some of them he will add to give you confidence that he is who he says he is. And as we said a few weeks ago, it's the one who makes the promises that really matters, right? And if there's someone that is serious about his promises, it's Yahweh. All right, number four, power. Three, Exodus 3.20, so I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And so God assures Moses of his power, that he's going to be with him, and that when he approaches Pharaoh, he's going to reveal that power. You know, he even gives uh, Moses a quick demonstration. He says, Moses, what's in your hand? Staff, throw it to the ground. Moses throws it to the ground. It becomes a snake. Moses runs away. I think that's hilarious. Like, when I play that in my head, I just imagine him, ah, <laughs> you know, right? And he picks it back up, becomes a staff again. Put your hand inside, becomes leprous when he takes it out, put it back in, it's healed straight away. So what God is trying to say is, you might feel weak. You might feel powerless, Moses. You might feel like you don't have what it takes. But let me tell you what, I am not weak. I am not powerless. I'm going to give my power to you, I'm going to reveal my power and it's going to shake the socks off Pharaoh. It's going to reveal my glory to the nations. Ah, so encouraging. And Jesus promised the same. He said, wait for power from on high. It's the Spirit of God, right? And when the Spirit of God came, the church exploded. And that same power that empowered the early church and came upon them lives in every believer in Jesus. You're a believer in Jesus here today? The spirit of the living God is in you and in me. That same power that enables us to do every, anything, strengthens us through all things through Christ. 
It's the same power that renews our inner being daily. It's the same power that gives us everything we need for life and godliness. And his calling lives in you and in me. So be like a solar-powered car, but powered by the Son of God. Amen? The Son of God. You will have all the power that you need to live into your call. You will. I will. We will. Provision. That's number five. In Exodus 3.21, God says, you shall not go empty-handed. And so uh, God says, I'm going to give you favor with the Egyptians. And so what you're going to do, get all the the people to do this, get them to, to talk to their neighbors, the Egyptian neighbors, and ask them for jewelry and clothing. And you know, uh, and then they're just going to give it to you. And so you will plunder Egypt. You're not going to walk away empty-handed. You're going to go into the wilderness like you've gone to a stock tag sale, right? You're going to have all that you need. And I, I love that. Just, just imagine this with me today. Imagine God gives you this promise, right? And then you wake up tomorrow morning and you knock on your neighbor's door. Um, excuse me, um, we're going on a journey to worship Yahweh. Uh, Do you have any jewelry or clothes? What do you think they're going to say? Oh, sorry, sorry, Andy. Uh, uh, Yeah, I've I've got to catch up on my K-drama right now. (laughs) What are they going to say to you? And yet, God gives them favor so that as they ask, the Egyptians go, oh, yeah, here you go. All right, here you go. Yep, it's yours. Take it. Take it. Take it to yours, right? It's amazing. Amazing favor. What is God saying? He's saying, I provide. Right? I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to give you what you need. And it may not be the way that you think you get it. But I'm going to provide it for you. I love this. And Jesus says the same. Don't worry about what you will eat or what you will wear. Your heavenly Father knows what you need. He loves you. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And if I could paraphrase it for the sake of today, lean into His call. Lean into His call. And you will see your heavenly Father provide everything that you need. Amen? Everything that you need. And I love the fact that the flowers of the field and the birds of the air are daily reminders of that promise. Oh, so good. And the last one is this. Scars and struggles on the way. But with joy our hearts can say that his pledge number six is people. (laughs) Okay. Is there not Aaron? He shall speak for you. Now, why is God saying this? Because after all of God's promises, right? After all of God's assurances, Moses says, oh, God, please send someone else. Look, I'll be honest with you. I'd probably say the same thing too. I'd probably say the same thing too if I was Moses. Um, but God, God says, okay, right? He was, he was angry with Moses right? after all that. God says, okay, I'm gonna, how about Aaron, your brother? He speaks well. I will send him to you. So even though he believed hmm, that Moses actually had the ability with his provision to be able to do the job, God still gives the extra support so that together they can fulfill God's plan. And Jesus does the same thing, right? He gives us each other, Amen. He sends us out two by two. You know, he gives us colleagues and partners to serve in the kingdom of God. I thank God for Stu. I thank God for Jean. I thank God for Jacob and Morgan and Reuben and Johnny. I thank God for Uncle Eric. I thank God for Johnny and Joyce. Because over the years, you know, Pearly and Nor, over the years, right? We've prayed together, we've labored together, we've discipled together, we've made strategic plans together, we've worshiped Jesus together. You know, we've, we've seen the miracles of God together. We've seen people come to faith together. We've baptized people together. We've dreamed big dreams and we continue to. 
as we listen to the voice of God. He gives us one another. I love the fact that I can catch up with Paul. We can have coffee and pray about the things that we long for God to do amongst us and that he starts to answer our prayers. I'm so thankful that I can celebrate with Angus over the upturn in our giving for the sake of the kingdom of God. He gives us one another to support each other, to encourage each other, to serve one another, to serve him, and to serve those that he's calling us to serve. God will provide. He will provide. He will provide the people that you need to fulfill your call. How do I know this? And I see it every day, every day. Sometimes I catch up with Adam. We're talking about full full gospel businessmen in Indonesia. And we pray together. God, send people and the most beautiful people. Ah, that God brings together. Hey, Adam, God is faithful. He sends people. He sends people. He's the CEO. He's the COO. He's the ultimate HR coordinator, procurement, right, recruiter. That's him. He will. And all of this is only possible in Jesus because he is the very presence of God. He is the fulfillment of all of God's prophecies and promises. They all point towards him. He is the embodiment of the fullness of the power of God. He is the source of all of God's provision. He is the bread of life. He is the fount of living water. He is the creator and sustainer of the universe. It's only because of him that we breathe right now. In him we live and move and have our being. It's only because of him, what he has done, the one who calls people every day through the cross and the empty tomb that you and I are able to even have a call, to even hear his voice, to even step into it. It's only because of Jesus. And he has made his home in every believer in Jesus. Wow. Therefore, live a life worthy of the calling that he's called you to. Amen. We echo the prayer of Paul and we turn to one another and plead with one another. Live a life worthy of the calling that Jesus has called you to. And he will provide all the strength and the power and the provision and the people and the promises and the prophecies and all the other peace-starting words that you and I need to live into that call. Spurgeon was 15 when he got called into preaching ministry. Wow. David was 40 when he became king. Moses was 80 when he stepped into his call. Abraham was almost 100, right, when he got his call. So it doesn't matter of our age, our gender, our family situation, our finance, how many sheep we got to take care of. It does not matter. The question is, will you heed his call? When he calls out to you, not from a, a bush that doesn't burn, but by the consuming fire of his presence. Will we run away? Will we try to avoid that fire, that presence? Will we kind of, la, 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 no, God, I just, no, there's too much other stuff I've got to do right now. How will we respond? Will you lean in to the call of God? And this is a scary question because it means laying our life down. It means in some ways, God, this is what I have for my life, but what do you have for my life? But let me tell you, you're not sacrificing your best life because your best life is pursuit of Jesus. My best life is living into the call of God in my life. Don't make any mistake about that. You live a life of pursuing Christ, you'll never regret it. So this is the soul training for this week. Re or slash discover your calling. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come and join me now. Um, Thank you guys. I know sometimes when we come to this point of a challenge for the week, sometimes we might switch off. Sometimes we might think, oh, that's lovely. 
but I, I, I've come to worship Jesus today and, and we've heard some Bible, so I'm, I'm ready to, to go just do something else for the rest of my day. But I want to encourage you that at the end of the day, the promises of God, sometimes we wonder why do we don't see them as much. But it's as we step out in obedience to God that we start to see His promises really come alive. And so this soul training thing, it's not just a, so be a good Christian and do something this week. No. Soul training is an opportunity to open our hearts so that the promises that we see in the Word of God can start to take root in the soil of our hearts. And as we step out in obedience, we will start to see the sprouting of life, of the seedling of His Word grow in our lives. And so I want to encourage you this week with this soul training to come humbly before God as Moses did and to just seek Him, to ask Him this simple question, regardless of where we are at our life at the moment. Lord, to whom or to what are you calling me to? And just see what He says. Don't give Him two minutes or five minutes, not even 10 minutes. I would encourage you to at least give 20 minutes to God. Could you do that? 20 minutes to God or more to say, God, I'm here. I want to listen to you. To have your burning bush moment with God afresh, whether for the first time or the 20th time. Sometimes things change. Sometimes He sharpens our sense of call. Sometimes He redirects us a little bit towards this space. Sometimes, you know, maybe for you, He'll give it to you for the first time. But I want to encourage us with that to take that time and then to talk to someone about it and pray together with someone about it. There is a shape resources that we provided uh, that's on the net. So I was gonna put the web address on there, but realize that that would be more confusing. So if you wanna find that resource, all you gotta do is Google Wesley International Shape Calling, okay? And then it'll come up as one of the first few hits. And if there's anything that we can do to help and support you in this, let us know, but our dream as WIC is that every single person that walks through these doors and becomes a part of this community moves from the general calling of God towards the funnel of the unique call that He has for their life. And that as a community of God's people, we will walk arm in arm and hand in hand to live into that purpose. That is our prayer as a church because that is the way in which transformed lives and transformed cities is going to hit another level, my brothers and sisters. So please, I encourage you, take some steps this week. Have your burning bush moment with Jesus and see what He says. I'm going to pray. The worship team are going to lead us in a song and then we'll have a bit of time to just wait upon the Lord together. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you were the one that met Moses in that burning bush moment. You were the one that had that plan that you'd prepared. And as you came to him and revealed yourself and called him, thank you that you were patient in his wrestle. We just pray for every single one of us in this room, us here on the stage, every single person in the seat, maybe even those in the cry room. And Lord, we pray even for our children in Kingdom Kids and in youth. We pray, Lord God, that you would reveal yourself to us as we seek you. Oh, Lord God, with Moses, he was on the way and you revealed yourself. But Lord, we wanna actively come to the consuming fire. We wanna actively come and seek you to seek out your voice, to seek out your purpose and plan. And thank you, Lord God, that it doesn't start with us coming to you. You've already come up with this plan. You're already in motion with your purpose of restoring this city and this nation, Lord God. You're already planning, you're already actively living out the plan to restore and transform lives and transform cities. So Lord, as we, as we meet with you and as you meet with us, would you give us confidence in the pledges that you give to your people that you will do what you say you will. Confidence for us to step out into the ocean, 
into the waters, even though we don't know what's going to happen. Confidence to lay our lives down before you and trust you with them. Do a new work in us, we pray. Help us discover and rediscover your call for our lives and for this church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.